Okay, uh, hello everybody. So uh, now we're gonna start our second uh, World Skills Conference talk. Uh, the talk today is going to be dedicated to the really interesting subject on can skills competition training and assessment be effective online. And uh, because right now in this uh, challenging time of the uh, COVID on post-COVID recovery, uh, while the whole world in the different stages but still facing the challenges of the global pandemic, the people and partners, the communities, especially the world skills communities globally, who always were um, involved within the TV delivery are probably in the most challenging situation because while in school or within the, a lot of kind of academia and universities, you still can continue the training in the, um, uh, I would say it's easier to move to the online while for VET and for the World Skills competition, it always was super important to stay, to be offline, to actually be physical, to have um, ability to demonstrate how the equipment work, how the skills and occupations are actually look like, to demonstrate excellence actually on practice. Uh, to allow, allow kids and teenagers and parents visit competition to see how the skills and, and occupations actually works. But uh, even though all of this, like being physical and being um, uh, very kind of illustrative and affordable to the public, it's super important. However, uh, we, the world skills community, also felt that it's not the right time to just uh, put all of the activities on pause, because uh, uh, this month is our actually crucial time for a lot of scholars who will need to make a choice about their future career, and this year is not exception. Um, so a lot of us have the scheduled world skills competition, who were either postponed or partly moved into the online way. So basically a lot of countries and members and organizations right now different trying different approaches to go online with the vet. And today within this hour we're going to discuss how it's actually happening um, and uh, going to discuss all of this pros and cons, uh, what's actually working, what's not working and how we can learn from each other. So um, right now I would move to introduce you to our speakers today. So today with us, Sean Torson, CEO of uh, Skills Canada. Uh, Jason Skells, uh, business manager on education, uh, global lead. Um, yeah, thank you for the slide. Business manager on education in the Lincoln Electric, our respected global industrial partner. Victoria Levin, uh, Global Lead on Skills Education, Global Practice and World Bank. Mr. Ranjan Chinduri, Senior Head, World Skills India, National Skills Development Corporation. And myself, uh, Ekaterina Voshkareva, I'm a board member within the Strategic Development Portfolio within World Skills International and also RMD Director for World Skills Russia. So, um, also, uh, dear audience, if you're going to have some questions during our conversation, please feel free to send this question either to Zoom or on a Facebook. We're definitely going to read them, and if we're going to have time, we will try to answer this, your question, in the second part of our conversation. Uh, so, but right now, we're going to have a short poll for you. Um, um, if I can ask to put this on our Zoom. So, because in the beginning, before we actually start our conversation, I would ask uh, you guys as our audience to make kind of your choice to answer your personal position, kind of, do you believe that skills competition, training and assessment can be effective online? Uh, or you actually think that no, if you're talking about the VAT delivery, skills competition, training, and all of this, it's also only can be kind of effective offline and that it's definitely require in-person um, involvement and otherwise it's just not gonna work. So let's spend like a few seconds to actually vote. And uh, we'll ask our technical team to show us the result. 
as a start from our for our discussion. Okay, so I would say it's moderately optimistic. So the bigger part of our audience, the 59% so far, believe that the uh, online training assessment and competition can be effective online, but uh, almost the kind of 40% still think that no, it's actually cannot. Uh, so let's see during our conversation, can we actually change their opinion? Uh, or maybe the percentage of those who do not believe that it can be effective on, offline can become actually even bigger. Uh, and before we're going to dive in into the deep interview, uh, dear uh, colleagues, uh, um, our experts today can I ask you please to share in one minute maybe your expectations for the session and literally kind of a few words about what's from your perspective within your practice right now, the most kind of vibrant question regarding the online uh, online activities, online competition, on training, which you are involved in. Uh, like what would be your, I don't know, the question that don't give you time to, you know, you wake up at night and you're thinking, how we're trying this online, but are we doing a good job or it's not actually being effective? So a few words of expectation, Sean. Maybe let's start from you. Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, to begin, I want to say happy Canada Day to all those Canadians watching out there. Um, my expectation for today is uh, have a, a lively discussion on really how far we can push uh, virtual online training uh, and assessment. Uh, where can we get to uh, comfort level with being able to make sure that those, we feel that those assessments are valid? Uh, and I guess the piece that uh, I wonder about is typically people that are interested in vocational education or, or those careers based around vocational education really like to do things with their hands. They don't typically want to be people that are sitting behind a desk. So how much virtual training and assessment can you give to people before you start to maybe discourage them from wanting to pursue that occupation because they are typically those that really are interested in uh, doing hands-on activities. So those are a couple of items for me today. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Rajan, what about you? So I think the most important for me would be how do you keep all the youngsters who've signed up for the national competitions engaged and motivated? That is one. And if you ask me what keeps me up at nights, I think how to get the entire training paradigm onto a virtual platform, how much of it can be done and how much of it would still require hands-on. So these are the, uh, that, that's to my mind, the uh, greatest challenge and whatever we are doing is essentially to address both of those. Thank you, Rajan. Jason? Well, thank you, Kate, and happy Canada Day to everybody in Canada. Sean, that was a great comment, and and I, I agree. I agree with the comments so far. I mean, the challenge is how are we going to keep students engaged? And, and this conversation is more about how is the paradigm shifting? How long is this paradigm going to be shift? And then what are the long term effects on training, competitions, and skill development? Is this really going to impact us? And I think it's going to go to a blended approach. I mean, you're going to, we're still going to engage in online learning, but there still has to be that hands-on development of the skills because just like Sean said, the people that engage in skill development or go into these career fields, they're, they're the learners that want to learn with their hands and they're very kinesthetic. And, and, and so we, we have to find ways to engage them, like Ron John said, and, and we have to keep them engaged. So I, I look forward to this discussion because I think it's going to be lively. There's a lot of things changing right now and it's very dynamic. Thank you, Jason. Victoria, what's about World Bank perspective on this? And your personal. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kate. I completely agree with the previous colleagues. Um, I think the engagement and motivation of learners online is extremely important. Uh, for the World Bank, we're also thinking a lot about equity issues in terms of access to the infrastructure and access to devices and the extent to which the students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and students from low-income countries 
have that necessary access in order to be able to learn and in order to be able to be assessed online. Um, and I think one issue that um, I think um, Sean brought up is the validity of the skills that you're assessing online, the extent to which you're assessing the skills you are trying to assess, as opposed to the digital skills that are necessary to navigate the online environment. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I, I think this is going to be a great learning experience for me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. So this brings us to actually start our conversation. And for beginning, I would ask to show the um, small map that we prepared for the beginning of this conversation. Uh, basically, it looks like uh, it's not all of the practices that are being implemented right now within the world skills community globally. It's just some, like literally some of the examples of the different activities which are happening right now in different countries. And we can see that some of them are mostly, I would say, kind of marketing and communication activities, which are still super important because uh, we want to stay engaged. We want to show our audience different approaches. A lot of actually former uh, champions, uh, although you actually cannot be a former champion, probably so just the champions and alumni are, uh, was making the online workshops from their home. Um, or from their colleges and demonstrating their skills for the broader, broader audience. Some of our countries actually started uh, different projects regarding the online uh, boot camps and different other types of camps for the experts, specifically for the digital skills, for instance. Um, we know that in some countries uh, there was uh, already attempt to run some of the in national online competition and so on. So basically we are talking about the big range of the different activities and actually speaking about the online competition right now, I would uh, ask our first uh, kind of panelist today, Sean, to tell us a little more about your uh, experience uh, in Canada, because as we all know, uh, Canada was actually one of the first who actually run the first uh, national competition, as you call it, in digital edition, yeah. As I heard, you even have the kind of the medal ceremony online. You also have some amazing initiative about the skills at home, skills from home challenges. A lot of, was amazing piece about the interviews with the alumni online, how you provide content to your schools, national and so on. So um, if you can please share with us some of the maybe findings what you learned from the first attempt to, um, not attempt, actually the first experience of the running national competition online. Um, again, maybe some pros and cons, please. Yeah, thanks for that intro. And yeah, I will, uh, I will focus uh, probably most of my discussion around the virtual competitions. Uh, but do want to just give a, a little bit of background. So uh, the time when restrictions were put in place in Canada around uh, COVID-19 was really what we call our competition season. So many of our provinces and territories were beginning to uh, host their competitions. Uh, also, our national competition sort of fell into that time frame. Uh, and uh, because of those restrictions, we weren't able to host those competitions in the same format. Uh, that being said, there was still a lot of excitement and interest uh, out there from people on what was happening in skilled trades, vocational education uh, community. So a lot of our provincial territorial offices started offering activities. So uh, as was mentioned, skills at home, skills from home challenges, uh, different interviews, different initiatives to keep discussion going around the importance of these occupations. Uh, so those were really designed to uh, engage the interest of, uh, of young people. Uh, and uh, then there was also instances where we were able to provide content when schools, in particular secondary schools, went online. Uh, we were able to provide some content that those students were able to use and teachers were able to use uh, during some of those online sessions. So that was, uh, I think, that sort of our short-term uh, efforts, uh, j again, just to keep discussion going and dialogue going around the importance of these occupations. Uh, 
what some of our provinces and territories did is then took that a little bit further and said, let's try to host virtual competitions. Uh, and that uh, was offered in some of those areas that you might think would be fairly simple to offer virtual competition. So a lot of the digital uh, focused technology areas, but also into some of the traditional uh, trade areas, uh, such as uh, carpentry, for example. Uh, so some of the things in organizing those competitions are similar to what you had to do uh, with usual competitions in that you need to have willing partners, you, you need to have strong technical experts that could build challenges that could be evaluated, and you need to, need to have interested participants. So many of those elements still need to be in place. You need to develop a strong technical description uh, and again, have those competitor projects and challenges that really uh, are appropriate for the group that you want to evaluate. Now, most of the uh, competitions that were developed uh, by our provincial and territorial offices were focused on secondary schools. Uh, but, uh, and I think an interesting element, what we learned from this is with those competitions, there was now a lot more direct connection to students and, uh, where in our usual competition format, we work through teachers or, or coaches uh, to get to those students. So one thing we discovered is there was a lot more direct connection with students. Uh, the form that the competitions took uh, varied depending on sort of the competition challenge, uh, but, but some of those were open-ended competitions, which meant there was a time frame. Uh, even as much as a week uh, for people to complete the project and then submit that project. Uh, but we did also have some virtual competitions where material, for example, in uh, a carpentry or a cabinet making project, um, material was put together in packages. It was sent to all of those individuals that registered for the competition. They received that material at their home or at a, uh, the place that they were going to perform the project. They were given a time frame, just like we do with usual competitions. Uh, they were asked to have an internet connection and a camera that in some instances was uh, set up and was monitored throughout the time of the project. Uh, some of the evaluation was also done using, uh, using that technology. Uh, and uh, in other instances, the video was captured and was available to be reviewed by judges that were going to evaluate the project later. Uh, so it, uh, you still had uh, competitions, you still had students working on projects, they were still being monitored, uh, and there was still evaluation that took place. Uh, you, you could do evaluation of carpentry cabinet making, for example, still, you know, have the competitor themselves take out the measuring tape, measure from certain distances to see if they had actually put the project together as per the specifications. So there was uh, some of that uh, interaction. Uh, I think uh, some of the elements to consider uh, that are challenging with that process is, again, as I touched on, how far can you go with that assessment? Uh, I think it was also, very evident that you need to have really strong communication as always around what the, the project is, uh, how competitors can communicate back and forth during that process if they do have questions. Uh, in many instances, uh, competitors were asked to use chat functions of the different platforms to communicate back and forth, but we realize that in some areas when people are really working with their hands all the time, uh, they lose a lot of time when they have to then pick up the device, send a chat message, as opposed to being able to just ask questions. So I think those would be uh, some elements that we would look at trying to adjust. Also look at working with smaller groups. So if you had a judge uh, that was monitoring the work of a number of competitors at the same time, uh, with their video and answering questions. You want to have smaller groups than what you would typically have just so that questions uh, can be, uh, can be um, responded to in a, in a timely way. 
Uh, and uh, when uh, looking at uh, these competitions, uh, as was mentioned, ceremony, you, you still want to do uh, a great celebration of the competitions and, the, and that work. Uh, and uh, one of our, in particular, one of our provincial offices did a great job of a totally online uh, award ceremony where in some instances they actually had medals delivered to competitors that were the winners, uh, respecting physical distancing uh, and broadcast all of that live uh, over uh, their different social media platforms. So you were able to still gather that same excitement around those uh, competitions. Yeah. So I think uh, from our experience, uh, again, you need to have partners that are willing to provide material uh, equipment. And I think uh, we're looking at in the future, could we even send packages of tools to each of those uh, individuals uh, for them to work on those projects? Uh, one thing that was considered that we didn't do this time was uh, receiving projects. So if pro projects were completed, that they could be sent to a central location and then evaluated by judges at that central location. Uh, it was something that was considered. It wasn't done this time, but it's something that we would definitely look at for the future. Uh, I think the takeaway is, uh, as a first run through, uh, you know, great interest from all of those groups that I've mentioned, from partners, from the technical people, and from participants. Uh, as a first try, we felt it was a great success, uh, but uh, we think we can go a lot further with it. And I'll just uh, leave my comments there. Thank you, Sean. Uh, considering your one of your like, kind of final points about the sending the results of the work actually of the participants. Uh, this is actually that we are hoping to try in Russia in September. So we're going to share with you how it's actually <laughs> uh, went. And uh, because of the both Russia and Canada are just like so actually big countries. Um, can you also um, highlight some, maybe you noticed, maybe it was not the case when, um, because it was a virtual competition, some of the participants from the territories like far away, I would say uh, was actually able to join because they need only kind of internet access. Um, um, while maybe if they will have to travel, it would be a question, can they come or they cannot and so on. So can you highlight maybe some kind of, there are some advantages of this situation? Yeah, so de definitely there are, we have those challenges in some parts of the country where you need to have strong uh, infrastructure, uh, internet connection, you need to have the access to those digital tools and those networks for this to work. So that is definitely a challenge in some jurisdictions, which I think Victoria uh, kind of touched on in her opening points. Uh, but there are advantages in that if you do have that infrastructure in place, you potentially have a larger group of uh, young people that you can access and that, that could involve in these competitions uh, because you are not as limited maybe by some of the, the cost and, and time restrictions that it takes for people to travel to a central location. Am I suggesting that we replace our face-to-face -face competitions with virtual competitions? Definitely not. Uh, I don't think there's anything that can replace the excitement of the face-to-face but the advantage is, yeah, there's opportunity to connect with a larger group of people in that uh, process. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So Ranjan, moving to your experience this year, I know that you also tried uh, um, and actually practiced a lot of online activities the, this year within the NSDC, yeah, with your private universities, with, with your kind of online training and training for trainers, um, within the world skills community and actually some of the interesting um, cases with the water technology skills and so can you please share your uh, perspective on the same question like what what work what doesn't work what you consider kind of the most relevant for the future learnings on this sure thank you Kate uh, you know when the first uh, the pandemic hit us the first thing that we did was while we were planning as to how we could move to a virtual, both in terms of training and competition, we decided at least in the interim period to do an outreach through social media. 
And this was for two reasons. One is to keep the competitors who had signed up engaged. And secondly, also to create awareness. And for this, we did a number of things which included showcasing some of our champions who were role models, asking people to, everybody has some facet which is uh, related to skills, so to display their skills online. And uh, we did it through the three uh, platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We did an entirely uh, uh, organic program. And what was very remarkable that uh, over a two month period, we got 3.7 million impressions. So during this period, uh, one of the things we decided was how do we address the challenge of training needs for those who had signed up for the competition? For We work normally with uh, different partners. They could be industry partners, private universities, and sector skill councils. These are the three main uh, partners. So what was decided is to do online webinars as well as online classes for different trades led by different uh, you know, partners. And the objective again was twofold. It wasn't just about providing training specific to the world skills or India skills competition, but also to give information about the trade per se. What are the eligibility requirements? What are the skill sets that are required? And what does it hold in terms of career prospects and career growth? This would then lead on to what is the world skills methodology? What are the different platforms, infrastructure, software, whatever was relevant to that particular trade? And then go down into a more granular approach in terms of what was required in terms uh, being mod, uh, in terms of the different modules. These were conducted not only by subject matter experts, but in a number of cases assisted by former champions, in some cases, industry experts. So a collaborative effort. Uh, while this was, uh, this was one that has happened and is going on, at some point of time, uh, we would also like to take this for training of trainers. But uh, I would now like to specifically touch upon water technology, which you touched, because that I think has a lot of relevance and it resonates with the world skills ethos, which is that world skills is not just about competition. It is also about collaboration. So for the world skills, uh, for water technology, the, we started off with a webinar initially, which was more about information, which was then followed by a three week online program. What was also remarkable is that we had students from, uh, participants from eight different countries other than India. And the instructors were not just from India, but we also had experts, say, for example, from South Africa, Hugo. So this really made it an international endeavor in every aspect. It wasn't just a delivery of, uh, let's say, knowledge. There was also demonstration of the finer aspects. And at the end of the program, there was an online assessment for the participants, post which uh, the participants would either get a certificate of participation or a certificate of attainment, depending on what they scored. So there would actually also be, a, um, a for them, a, a, a report in terms of which are the areas which were their areas of strength and which are the areas of improvement so that it, it could be used for them 
to work on their weak aspects as they move along. The partners who have delivered these programs, while initially all of this was to test the waters and to see what were the challenges uh, in online delivery, the thought process is also eventually going forward. Would it be possible to make this into a sustainable endeavor by charging a small fee? Because when you look at whatever we are doing in terms of online efforts, one is to address the immediate challenge that has been posed on account of the lockdown or the pandemic. But going forward, if we find that there are aspects or there are initiatives which would be meaningful even in a quote unquote normal circumstances, then there's no reason why this cannot be further refined and taken forward on a regular basis. Like Kate, you mentioned that uh, both with Russia and Canada, you have a challenge with geography. It's the same with India. We are actually a subcontinent. We've had 30 different states and union territories coming forward. So the easiest way at times, uh, there's asymmetry of information, there's asymmetry of training opportunities. So the easiest way to reach out is online. So I think going forward, while we address the short term challenges, I think the longer term learnings for this will also be equally important, not only for us in India, but in most countries in terms of efficiency, in terms of efficacy, uh, et cetera. So this was about training of uh, competitors. There is also another component which we are working on. We haven't yet uh, launched it, but it's very uh, much on the anvil and on the planning board. And it also comes out of necessity. We had a series of online workshops which were lined up for the subject matter experts for different trades from the 30 states which were participating in our nationals to give them a hands, uh, to give them an understanding and experience about the world skills methodology and most important, the marking and assessment scheme. So per force, we need to move it onto an online platform, which is something which we will be doing, but it's work in progress. This led to another line of thought. We've been having a series of discussions with our experts, with our industry partners. And uh, we had decided that we would invite international participants as, as well as experts for our uh, national finals. But since now this becomes a question mark, we would still like to go ahead and invite international experts because we feel that their presence and their being part of the assessment team would add value to the rigor of the entire assessment process and hence the selections that we do. So we are talking with our experts to see how we can have international experts participating in our national competitions through a virtual platform. If while it is very easy for digital skills, even for other trades like beauty and wellness and others, our experts have said that it is possible so we would be going ahead and doing this, and this would be a learning for us, which we would like to equally share with the others as well. So that in a nutshell is, Kate, what I'd like to share with you and the audience at this point of time. Thank you, Rajan. And I think that, I mean, you raised several amazing points, but actually one of them, which really resonates me is about the cooperation 
you know, because the world skills is usually considered in some, you know, like really competitive communities, which is partly true, because when you are compete for the medals, you're supposed to be competitive. It's totally normal and fine to be competitive. But in this challenging time, and especially within our expert community, we actually can see this um, desire and this uh, effort to cooperate within the trainers. And this is why not like, all of this training for trainers uh, and the training during workshops and webinars formats actually flourish right now. Now this is when I move to want to say a few words about our work with Russia experience uh, that uh, actually um, the few our projects uh, like for instance our joint project with the World Skills Asia which started today actually from the 3D game design uh, training for experts started today and uh, of course, um, this online training for experts, we started with the World Skills Asia and colleagues from Static uh, 1C and some other companies starting from the digital skills, because usually I think you all know that the digital skills guys, so this is those who transferred the easier way to, um, to the online and digital because they actually used to it, you know, they already work within the digital and IT community and environment. So for them, like we are moving online, they're like, come on, we are we already online, you know, this is where we live. Um, so I think this is why like a lot of virtual competition and the training for trainer experts started from the digital skills, which is logical. Uh, and we actually today also going to hear the Jason perspective of the welding because this is something that is much harder to bring online, um, which uh, comparing to the digital skills. However, we started this online training for experts in digital skills. Um, uh, we also really excited that our prime minister a few days ago officially announced that the world skills russia are gonna be responsible for retraining of 110 000 of citizens uh, suffered who suffered from the COVID and post-covid situation so the world skills russia are gonna be um uh as the world skills russia we will retrain them and give them uh one more practical skills based on the world skills standards uh, and it's going to be both the graduates from the TVET and from the universities basically anybody who suffered from COVID maybe lose their job and feel that they need a new skills so it's going to be really a massive program for us in case of the digital skills it's going to be online it's case of the uh, more traditional skills it's going to be distributed the same as our national final which is going to happen this year in September and going to last two weeks instead of usual four days. Because we actually, what Sean mentioned, we're going to implement a lot of stuff that he already described that, so I would not repeat to this, but uh, those skills who are, um, can be assessed uh, and actually be demonstrated and be basically visible online as a digital skills. The rest going to be what we call distributed format. Basically, when uh, the experts are all together in the expert control center, while the competitors, in our case, they are from 85 regions, they're going to stay within the region and just come to the, the come, of course, respecting all of the security and health and social distancing norm, come to the certified Wolskis Russia centers in the region. So they are actually going to be connected to the experts uh, via cameras. And in those skills where you physically cannot assess the results uh, based on the just video, we actually going to ex use express mailing to send uh, the result of their work to the expert center. So experts can actually see and access it and assess it physically as well. So this is going to be our uh, big, uh, uh, probably the biggest national competition this year in the virtual distributed format in uh, Russia this year in September. Uh, also, the conference program, of course, also going to be online and we welcome international participants who can join online. And for instance, even in our junior skills today, we have a confirmation from Malaysia and Barbados to join a junior world skills competition. 
um, considering the regarding the Roscoe Junior competition, they do not stop their activities as well. There was some online camps for students in June where Roscoe's Russia Juniors took part and also they're going to be going back to Ranjan Point uh, training uh, between experts in August within the Roscoe's Junior Russia experts. Um, also, we started uh, some fascinating uh, projects about the uh, Roscoe's Russia Future Skills uh, session because right now, when again, we cannot all come together we still can use the wisdom of the community and re to reflect how actually technology changes, industry changes, society changing right now so fast. So it's, of course it's influenced skills as well. And we feel kind of us responsible to reflect this and to actually being able to also then adjust our uh, skills because of all of these changes. So, so a lot of stuff going on here in Volskis, Russia, but I'd actually want us to also have some chance to answer some questions. So I'm going to shorten my part and probably would move to Jason right now, because as we already mentioned, it's almost all clear about the digital skills. You need to have good internet connection. Yeah, some really kind of eager, motivated experts, participants, of course, but again, most of the time they're used to it. Uh, but in case of the welding and other, what I would say, I don't know, hard skills, which always require like super physical hands-on equipment and where the whole sense of the skills is actually being able to do this and to work with this equipment and so on. So how are you dealing with this within the welding community? What maybe some new tools, findings, ideas, can you please share with us? Chase Newman. Thank you, Kate. And, but I would, I, I would agree with Sean. I mean, when we look at the competitions, there has to be accountability. Uh, there also has to be a degree of integrity with that, that skill. And so using videos in the welding booth, live streaming over the internet where judges can see the students actually, or their participants welding is gonna be key. But you know, the challenge comes back to infrastructure. Even in the United States, I mean, there are certain areas in the United States that do not have quality internet access. And the ability to do things remotely becomes very difficult. And I think I heard a statistic one time that, you know, more than 90% of people have access to the internet. But the challenge is the access becomes through their phone. And it's not really accessed through a computer-based system or another, another system. So, that, that's a challenge that we have. The other thing that I would say is, I would also call this the great awakening. Because when you think about skill development, we always thought it had to be face-to-face, on-site. We couldn't transfer knowledge unless they were in the classroom or in the welding booth, if you will. And now what we've done is we've stressed the system and it forced us to put learning online and I would call it the knowledge transfer is now online. And I think it's gonna be very different when we come out of this uh, post COVID. And I think how we use simulation, how we use virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, we put stuff uh, online where students can experience or people can experience a skill, um, learn the basics of that skill, and then maybe go to a training center to finish the development of that skill. And, and what does that really look like? I, I don't know. I think we're learning every day what that opportunity presents. But um, like what Ranjan said, how are we going to train instructors? How are we going to deal with incumbent workers that were displaced because of COVID and now retrain them for a different skill? We're hosting our first virtual train the trainer starting next week, where we're going to be training welding instructors how to teach differently because now they are teaching online. How do we use a virtual experience to demonstrate a skill? So, I, you know, I don't know that any of us really have the right answer right now. And I think we're experimenting with a lot of different ways to assess a certain skill. We're experimenting with a way to transfer the knowledge uh, to, to the participants wanting to learn. But we also cannot forget that part of these skills it, it's more of an art as well. And, and when we talk about an art of the skill, we talk really about the proficiency of that skill. 
So I can teach somebody how to tighten a nut on a bolt, and we can use tools to do that, and that's very simple. But learning the proficiency around welding and becoming very proficient in welding, it takes time, and it takes a coach, and it takes somebody with a, a mastery of that skill to help that learner, that person develop that proficiency. We can't take that away. Uh, that, that's going to be there. And so how we deal with the knowledge transfer online, how we deal with the skill development uh, at a learning center, it's going to be different. And I think we're all accepting that now. And it's now just a race to find out how do we really do it effectively? And, and, and how do we hold people accountable? So I'm going to yield my time because I, I look forward to Victoria's comments from the World Bank. But uh, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Jason. And maybe, um, again, uh, jump into the some of the questions. Do not answer now. But actually, yeah, like a lot of questions from our audience are about the how can we carry out assessment for manufacturing sectors like plumbing um, and so on. So basically, yeah, like a lot of our audience are worried about how in this case exactly what kind of you describe as actually can be or cannot be effective online. So maybe some additional thoughts on this later. Victoria, okay. from the perspective of World Bank, of course, as an international kind of in the organization, you are observing like very different processes regarding the VET online and the skills development and right globally and different countries being kind of in the same boat, but not really because the situation with internet access and so on also different. So what would be your kind of learnings on this? Thank you so much, Kate. That's a very important question for us here in the Skills Global Solutions Group at the World Bank. Um, so we know that TVET and skills development systems more generally are facing great challenges during this COVID-19 era in terms of continuing to provide education and training services. But we feel very strongly that TVET can be uniquely well positioned to develop the skills that can help countries mitigate the impacts of the pandemic both in the immediate term and in the longer term. And this is for two main reasons. First, TVET sector has a unique focus on practical skills and work readiness with students' mindsets that is usually focused on entering the labor market. And second, the TVET sector has the ability to provide shorter and more modular training so it can be more easily reoriented to meeting uh, emerging skills needs. So together with ILO and UNESCO, we have collected survey data from TVET providers, policymakers, and social partners on how TVET systems around the world are addressing COVID-19. And looking at preliminary results only, we're still working on the final analysis, we see that TVET institutions, meaning school buildings and physical classrooms, were completely closed in over 90% of respondents' countries. And yet, many respondents reported that their institution has been contributing to the immediate challenges of COVID-19. Some institutions, for example, ramped up health-related training, so both for healthcare workers and for workplaces that needed to understand how to respond to new health and safety regulations. Some TVET centers contributed to manufacturing PPE, um, such as face masks or face shields or ventilators for local hospitals. So in Peru, for example, a respondent reported that students were making phone calls to support frontline healthcare workers. But going beyond the immediate impacts and TVET contributions, um, it is also essential that learning continuity is supported, and this is what uh, we have been discussing earlier uh, in this um, webinar. So early findings suggest that uh, most countries were able to switch to some form of remote provision of training during the pandemic. But it is quite concerning to us that, for example, in Africa, respondents reported, the majority of respondents uh, reported that all training was canceled as no online or offline option was available. For countries and institutions that did switch to remote provision, uh, about half of all respondents reported only using online platforms, and another third reported using both online platforms but also complementing with offline tools, such as using print materials or TV and radio programs. 
And given that TVET often pairs classroom instruction with work-based training, the apprenticeships, um, our joint ILO, UNESCO, and World Bank survey asked about disruptions in that part of the training system as well. And preliminary results show that it is facing serious disruption, um, but with some exceptions. So for example, for occupations, as UK mentioned, occupations that rely on ICT, um, they were more able to switch to remote work and thus continue work-based training. And finally, on the front of skill assessments, which is very close to the mission of uh, world skills, it seems that many countries postponed assessment of TVET students, especially when they needed to assess practical skills. But there are reports of assessments being carried out either in person with very strict health and safety regulations and social distancing or online. And again, particularly for uh, occupations and skills related to ICT or by submission of portfolio of students work that can be submitted online. So just to summarize, uh, while COVID-19 definitely presented multiple challenges to TVET institutions around the world, particularly in low-income countries, many institutions and systems have risen to these challenges. And we see examples of this uh, in this webinar as well. And they're contributing to fighting the pandemic, but also helping students continue on their learning trajectory. Thank you, Victoria. Maybe following uh, some of the questions, because you mentioned Africa in your speech and some of the challenges, we have some questions from Uganda. How can you help kids at home who were studying from technical colleges doing courses like fashion and design? Maybe there was some findings from the survey or maybe some other speakers can also like, kind of share some ideas for this question. I think, I think um, the possibility of moving some training or some assessment online completely depends on the type of occupation that one is referring to. So for example, for fashion and design, one could probably think of continuing to hone some skills at home. Um, and my colleagues from World Skills can probably talk more on this uh, subject as well. But there are some skills that can be continued to be developed at home, such as social emotional skills, which are going to be increasingly valued in the post COVID-19 environment. Um, skills such as uh, higher order cognitive skills. Uh, such as critical thinking and problem solving, which is needed across occupations. And of course, digital skills. So even in fashion, I'm not a fashion design expert, but I'm sure that there is software that can be learned uh, if there is access to such software. Um, and, and then personal development is always important. So even when there is no connectivity, developing the skills that can be developed while in this difficult circumstances is very important. Thank you, Victoria. And also one of our uh, listeners, uh, our audience uh, bring up the question that we wasn't touching today and maybe we will not dive in into the details because it's opened the whole bunch of new question, but it's a question about certification. And I think a lot of us are actually dealing with this uh, uh, right now anyway. So the question was, will certificates of online learning be considered for job promotion? But maybe this question is even broader. Yeah, so everything right now uh, where the vet was also basically pushed to move online in some forms, Victoria, as Victoria said, yeah, a lot of countries just postpone the, uh, like the final exams within the vet and so on. But in the world skills, we are we have I would say like a little more freedom with this because it's more going back to our expert community because if the expert community can uh, responsibly say that they trust the result of this assessment, uh, for instance in the digital skills, but not only if they observe the whole process of the virtual training, then they receive physically the results of the um, students' work. So they trust the result basically. So for instance, in Russia, we're using for this, the, what we call the skills passport, which is basically the result of the competition, but also demonstrating in the modules form, like what result the student achieved. But the question of certification is still 
uh, still vibrant for a lot of people. So they're going to learn a lot of stuff. They're going to go through the webinars and training and so on. But will uh, companies actually accept such type of the uh, kind of proof or not? Maybe first some comment from Jason as actually a representative from the business and maybe some other speakers as well. Right. No, thanks, Kate. That, and that's a great question because, you know, if you think about a certificate, the reason we have a certificate is it demonstrates somebody's or acknowledges that they've learned a skill, but then they've also successfully demonstrated a certain level of proficiency with that skill. So that's what the certificate's really supposed to measure. And as long as there's accountability behind that certification, then I think industry would accept it. And that's where industry's got to start thinking about this in a different way. The, the other challenge that, that comes is we also have seen in the industry sector that certificates have become a commodity, meaning that you have a lot of different agencies or certifying bodies that are releasing certificates that may not has be as valuable or valid as others in that industry. And so we have to be cautious to make sure that the validity uh, behind that certificate is, is there and that the certificate is truly doing what it's supposed to do by measuring the knowledge and then saying that the student or person has successfully demonstrated their proficiency. And I think once we do that, industry will, will accept it because it's valid. But we have to be very cautious to make sure the certificates are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Jason, maybe some other comments on this? Sean here. Um, so uh, on, I guess I, I would say picking up on, on some of the previous comments and as well as this question, uh, I think obviously a, lo a lot of training can take place online. And when I think you're looking at final assessments and certification, uh, if you can still arrange for the, the final assessments on all of that work that may have been done at home uh, or in some other location respecting physical distancing, uh, but in many instances, I think you'll still wanna bring those individuals to a location to do a final assessment for certification and accreditation. And then I think that will speak to what Jason talked about uh, on business accepting that. The other element uh, I would uh, would uh, want to just make a point on is, you know, how learning can take place at home. So if we think about before we started moving people to factories to work and moving people to central locations for training, uh, craftsmanship uh, was really developed in homes and people learned from other family members how to perfect certain skills. Uh, we, we then move to these centralized models of training and, and work locations, which is great. But w I think what it demonstrates is it was possible at that time, if you have proper trained uh, experts, people that can pass on that knowledge, that some of that really strong training can take place in a home environment and then be taken out later and receive accreditation. Thank you, Sean. Uh, also, some of the questions are about the uh, actually persons with the disabilities and how do you address inclusion uh, for equity of persons with disabilities? So Victoria also maybe some comment from the World Bank because again, from our perspective, it's like, uh, Logically speaking, if you implement some digital and online tools, it actually should uh, broader, uh, bring more possibilities for people for whom it would be not kind of physically available in the other circumstances. But maybe again, there are some like challenges in this as well. That, that's a very important question. And inclusive education is one of the goals, uh, one of the commitments that the World Bank has including throughout the education uh, cycle, so including the TVET sector. Um, uh, I completely agree with you, Kate. I think good quality and accessible um, uh, online or digital learning 
can expand access to students with disabilities. Of course, it depends on what disability we're talking about. But you're right, the students who cannot physically come to a training center can benefit from having these opportunities to receive training online. Um, there's also the possibility of providing assistive technologies that can read out, let's say, the text that is provided to visual learners. Um, but I think usually, at least in the developing country context, there is an intersection between disadvantage and access to infrastructure and students with disabilities that is a, presents a, a very significant challenge. And we're working on it, um, but it is something that, that is challenging to tackle. Thank you, Victoria. So uh, officially, like our, uh, our hour is finished, but because we have so many questions, we extended our session for 10 more minutes. So please stay with us. We're going to have also some final poll and we will try to answer a few more questions because just so many of them. Um, Ranjan, there is a like really long question to you. I will try to read it fast. <laughs> so maybe you can also give it some comment on this. Uh, well done on the NSDC initiative. It was a privilege to be a part of the Water Technology Webinar Series. We need to ensure that we also put they also put infrastructure on place to expand the practical task, task portion. How would you see student and particular parent uh, apprehension on safety of uh, participants can be addressed? When knowledge assessment is done, students are keen, but when physically applied skills need to be done in centers, there is a significant resistance, especially in areas where pandemic impact is escalating at present. So it was a really long question, but can be, Ranjan, please yeah. kind of sum up your position on this. Sure. Uh, in fact, to address this very concern, the national competitions that we are planning, we will not hold it in a central venue as it's normally done. But for each trade, we would be holding them in institutes with the necessarily, with the necessary physical distancing norms where the numbers of people would be lower and we could also address the concerns of the participants as well as parents being young adolescents this is very very it's a very real concern we accept it and that's how we would uh, seek to address it and in any case we will not be holding the final competitions till and until there is a green signal in terms of the uh, pandemic having abated to a controllable limit. Thank you. And also we had a question uh, specifically dedicated to Sean. Sean, how do you work around the challenges of health and safety of young people training or competing from home? Yeah, so great question and, and definitely uh, important element. Uh, so just as we do with our competitions when we're on site, uh, we have uh, safety guidelines, uh, thing, areas, uh, different elements that need to be respected around uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, in the case of the online, uh, the virtual competitions, a safety checklist was sent to all of those competitors. So they needed to make sure that they had those certain elements in place in their uh, home location or whatever location they decided to work. Uh, and, but uh, that does require some more personal responsibility from participants. But we did provide information to them that they could use as a guide to make sure that they did have a safe work environment. Thank you, Sean. And probably our last question is going to be from Finland, uh, because we still have uh, much more, but we kind of respect the time of our audience, so we promise that it'd be one hour, maybe a little bit. So the final question, training online is normal in ICT skills like web development. We also talk about this a lot during this conversation. In Finland, we have had online competition in web for over 10 years. The test project has to be done so that in the assessment, the judges can be sure that the work is done by the current competitor, of course. 
Uh, do you think that this kind of online competition can be part of world skills also? So probably this question is actually uh, bigger, you know, probably it's a question about like what's uh, kind of learning from the both uh, online competitions and maybe some experiments with the similar skills can be brought to the world skills uh, kind of competition in the long term strategy. It's final round. So I would just say very quickly, I think uh, competitions like that can be part of world skills. Uh, but the element that we need to consider about world skills is it is the competition experience, but it is also the entire experience. So it's, yes, it's measuring your skills against uh, other individuals from other countries in your particular skill area, but the entire experience of being part of a team, representing your country, traveling to another location, uh, I think is equally important in that. Uh, that the growth of those individuals that participate. Thank you, Sean. Ranjan, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with Sean because it's not just about a competition or uh, measuring a person's competence or proficiency. It's the entire competition experience which I think provides, makes world skills what it is. Okay, thank you. And I think as wrapping up what we just discussed, uh, again, it was not basically our choice <laughs> to suddenly start doing all of this, like give us lemon. We were trying to make a lemonade out of this. And it looks like even from our discussion, a lot of things actually work. There was a lot of kind of positive uh, findings and uh, aspects such as, for instance, when Victoria uh, mentioned the module structure. I think this is, yeah, like really one of the strongest parts of that. When it's module, you can break into the pieces and do what you can do effectively online, even if it's going to be, let's say, three modules out of 10, but it's still probably better than just like frozen and wait until the situation is going to be resolved. Because right now, I think nobody actually knows when the situation is going to be completely back to normal and so on. So I think we should encourage our community and our experts and we are thankful for those who have courage to try new things because it's always hard, especially in this like challenging times. We actually also have a lot of questions that we probably not going to be able to address today about the virtual uh, simulations, augmented reality and stuff like this. It's always fascinating. And of course, in, in all of the skills when it's possible to use it, and it's affordable, it should be used. Again, right now in the situation, we, of course, we're always going to have the debate about the simulation versus real equipment. But when you're in the situation when you do not have a choice, I think it's pretty kind of wise to still at least try to use it. And maybe for the future, it can be also useful in some particular, again, modules and skills, not generalizing it to like literally everything. Uh, we also discuss interesting aspects about the distance uh, and it's not only for the big countries where used to have a challenges with the different time zones and like some distant territories. Uh, but I think for, for the whole world, while we are actually in a lot of things, we're started to feel more connected through, through this. And uh, um, yeah, and those who were these pieces where we will still have to postpone some of the activities, some of the final exams, some of the national competition, it still kind of feels right to try to do what, what we can do. When we have internet and equipment, when we don't have internet, but still like encourage our experts and students to maybe master some soft skills and interpersonal skills and whatever can be achieved in this kind of challenging time to still keep moving. So I would ask uh, our um, administrative team to bring our final poll right now um, about uh, can skills competition training and assessment be effective online in some forms? And then see if our discussion changed the mind and the perception of our audience in some way. Um, Let's see, and I'm in advance, I'm sorry for those whose question we were not able to answer right now. The topic really feels like hard. We have a lot of interest to this. So maybe the, then definitely the conversation about this is gonna be 
um, continued. So let's see how the opinion of the audience has changed. Yes, it looks like um, 20 more percent of our audience believe now that in some form, skills competition training and assessment with the careful quality control, of course, uh, still can be in some form effective online. So it looks like really, uh, really nice result of our conversation. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up right now. Thank you all a lot. I think it was really fascinating, interesting discussion. Thank you to our audience. Thank you a lot to our Wolska secretary team who prepare and manage all of this for our amazing speaker and their practices. And on a slide right now, you can see some upcoming talks. Um, for instance, the next uh, talk going to be about ensuring the skills reflecting, reflect society about the diversity and inclusion in competition and beyond. We already touched this topic part in our conversation today, but of course it's so important that it surely deserves kind of the full separate conversation. Um, and I think that's going to be it. Thank you all so much.